physically, uh, emotionally, spiritually satisfying lunch time conversations. Um, and we're going to launch into um, what has become um, uh, a very exciting and consistent part of our conferences, um, which is Hot Topics. And so I'm going to pass the mic to um, Brian Moore and Diane Brewer, who are going to be your facilitators for this session. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, hi. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Brian Moore, uh, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, I am with uh, Concordia University in Nebraska. Uh, I just want to quickly thank you for being here. Uh, we're excited to share this with you, our, our annual event of Hot Topics. It's part of the University Caucus, uh, which has been around for as long as LMDA has. And this has been um, one of those great opportunities for us to share many of the, um, the ideas, the thoughts, the projects, uh, et cetera, uh, that are taking place uh, around uh, uh, academia and beyond. Um, and it's always exciting to see what people are thinking, what people are doing, and to um, be able to share that with each other, to inspire and spark more conversation and dialogue and uh, practice from here on out. So um, if uh, you are interested in ever, uh, if interested in doing this in the future, um, uh, please don't hesitate to contact uh, Diane or me. Um, there's information about Hot Topics as well as the Ucaucus on uh, the handout that has been around. Um, if you um, do not have a handout, uh, feel free to come find us later and we can get you access to it or at least information about Hot Topics in the future. Um, I'm going to let you go ahead and read this, but for time's sake, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to pass it on to Diane Brewer, who is the VP for uh, university relations, and she will let you know what we're going to be doing. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so, very quickly, I'm just going to orient you to, to how we're going to do this. Those of you who are listening, you are going to practice what you do best, which is making connections between seemingly unconnected things. Uh, <laughs> the The People who are presenting are going to go in order on your list. The first person is live. The, the next two people are not behind me right now, but they will be, are, are Skyping in from off-site. Yasmin was not able to join us, so she's actually she's not on your list as you're going through and um, reading and keeping track of who's talking and what they're talking about. They are going to jump up and introduce themselves because time is so tight and also because we're giving them the opportunity to remember why they decided not to be actors. We are going to strictly time them. As soon as they open their mouths and say the first word, the timer is going to start. Then at four minutes, they're going to get a hand signal from Kathleen. And at five minutes, Kathleen will say thank you and they will say thank you, and then the next person will come up. That's how it's gonna work. It's pre-arranged. You don't need to be high anxiety about it as you see it happening. Here we go. Hello. Oh, yes, hello. There we go. Okay, so hello. I'm Hanna Sletne. Um, I am a Swedish dramaturg. We've been working in theatre in the UK and Ireland for uh, 20 years, mainly in new writing, but also with a focus on interdisciplinarity and with a special interest in the sonic arts. Uh, I am not an academic, so when I talk about my uh, research, it's pra uh, purely a, a practice-based sort of artist and project-based research. So my latest interest in research is creating a new approach within my practice uh, that I'm calling sensory dramaturgy, but I am sure there are lots of people who can uh, ha come up with a better name and uh, have much more uh, insight into this than possibly I have. Um, the reason why I'm developing this is because I have been uh, engaged to dramaturg three separate pieces uh, lately. One is exploring the world 
uh, as experienced by a brain changing because of Parkinson's disease and how sound and stories can put up some resistance. The second is a writer realizing that she's already halfway through a journey of losing her hearing. And she wants to use the sonic arts and storytelling to explore her changing relationship with the spoken word and with communication. The third one is a dancer who's registered blind and through her work is trying to understand how she watches dance, how she connects with movement, both as an audience and as a blind dancer, and how she can share her world with those sighted. Uh, so my experience so far teaches me, um, in particularly the five years that I was working on a piece called Reassemble Slightly Askew, that I will talk about more uh, later in the conference, that interdisciplinarity is key to this thing that I'm calling sensor dramaturgy. Um, in the three very different processes, um, I aim to introduce ways of working with all the senses through multiple art forms in order to take pressure of the art form and the sense that we are actively investigating. Um, I think if you're working with a brain that is experiencing change or damage, it's helpful to completely move away from trying to make that brain do what it used to do. So for me, it's about devising a dramaturgical process that bypass the familiar, and in some cases, bypass the damaged area of the brain in order to invigorate other parts and to create new pathways. So as a dramaturg then, I feel I need to not only understand what is changing in the word of the artist, but also what kind of brain the artist had before the change started to happen. And this route uh, uh, of discovery is going to be circular, playful, and with plenty of time for rest. Um, I need to help them find the balance between the areas of expertise where excellence, skills, talent, and craft means everything to them as artists and very important as they're part of, uh, part of their identity. And then we need to use other artistic expressions which are about research and exploration in which the brain can rebalance and rest where the stakes, artistic stakes, are not so very high. So it requires me to find genuinely innovative and bespoke approaches, which is where I would love uh, some communications with you guys. Uh, and also a mindset where I tune into my own sensory perceptions as if I know nothing, whilst keeping grounded in my years of experience of process and dramaturgy. So the benefits, if we get it right, um, is artistic innovation. But of course, we don't know what that is yet. And of I hope we get three pieces of uh, art, which are excellent and beautiful in their own right, with proud and satisfied artists. And as I believe in the plasticity of our brains and in, healing in the its healing capacity, I am convinced the work will benefit both participants and audiences alike. So my research uh, is therefore twofold. It's about how I facilitate and dramaturg each process to help that artist find their form and expression uh, and the unique piece of work. And it's for myself as a dramaturg. How do I expand my own perceptions and sensory world to be a useful cog in the wheel on these collaborative journeys. The three processes will remain completely separate apart from me flying like a bumblebee from one flower to the other for some cross-pollination. But then in November this year, I am bringing all the artists together um, for a workshop as, in, as part of the Being Human Festival in the UK, which will hope hopefully open up the learning points. And I think that's when the big challenge will uh, come because then we're starting to talk about access and inclusion across these three pieces. Um, so I wanted Thank to reach you. out to anyone here to come and chat to me if you have experience in this area. Thank you.
Test, 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 test. Um, I, I'm working on the dramaturgy of memory. Uh, I apologize to uh, some of you because I've been working on this for a while. So uh, for some of you, this will be reworking the dramaturgy of memory. Can you hear me all right, Janine? Okay. A family stands on the east bank of the Missouri in Chamberlain, South Dakota. They're in the middle of everything. The parents are in their mid-40s, the children, a girl and a boy, 14 and 11, neither little kids nor adults. They're in the middle of the country, on the edge of the west, on the great plains of dinosaurs, of buffalo and prairie grasses, of the Lakota, of Lewis and Clark, and Little House on the Prairie, of Custer's Last Stand and Wounded Knee, of Manifest Destiny, in nuclear silos built for the war no one will win. They're so young, so full of possibility. The husband and wife are having a silly fight left over from the end of dinner. It's exact uh, cause forgotten, something to do with whether or not to order one or two pieces of pie for dessert. They're trying to work out their grievances, but at the moment no one is talking, and, and uh, even though the quarrel is silly, the alienation is real, sharp and cold. At some level, the husband wishes it was just him on this journey, a motorcycle and no commitment longer than a one-night stand in a rundown motel. At some level, the wife knows that a deep part of herself, her dignity, her soul even, is at stake, the part that makes living more than one long surrender. The children stand off to one side, silent, wary, maybe throwing rocks into the deep, swift water of the great river, a pulsing, relentless vein flowing into the country's heart. The river is crucial, and so is the sky, the great arc of the horizon, sunset clouds supersaturated with reds, oranges, and yellows, a landscape that makes cynicism impossible. More might be written about each one of these elements and others unlisted, but I will emphasize only one. It was a profoundly unhappy scene. Despite, or maybe, maybe even because of its pettiness, although our antagonism was more or less resolved before we went to bed that night, and the next day's journey was one of the best days of family travel I can remember, Chamberlain was deeply unpleasant. And yet, over 20 years later, I take pleasure in its recollection. Indeed, the scene on the river has, in part because of the multiple dramaturgies it supports, become the kind of sustaining memory one can carry into the night. Nostalgia plays an important role in all of this, a yearning for a time in which the ratio between energy and exhaustion was more on the side of energy, for children who are still children, for the challenge of a new job in a new place, for the mystery of middles rather than the certainty of ends, even if the moment itself was unhappy. But I think another more powerful yearning is at work here, one no doubt also sentimental, the need, desire, necessity to be written, to have a story, a plot, in both senses of the word, a parcel of ground within a landscape, on a stage, in a cemetery, an ordering of events linked by time and causality, a journey from here to there. The four people on the river persist because they have a plot, a place, a story. For a moment, they are standing on the top of the world, bound to water, earth, and sky. For a few days, they are nomads, travelers, homeless, not at rest physically, mentally, or emotionally. They are unsettled, disrupted, uprooted, disturbed awakened from the quiescence and death of being a happy family. For happy families are storyless. We want to be this family because to be unhappy is bearable. To be plotless is not. I'm going to read to you, and then I'm going to run out of time. <laughs> uh, I want to spend five minutes with you thinking about dramaturgy and invisibility. The invisibility of dramaturgs, the invisibility of dramaturgy, 
and dramaturging the invisible. And I want to start with this, my favorite joke. What did the Zen student say to the hot dog vendor? Make me one with everything. <laughs> I want to talk to you for what's probably only four minutes remaining about dramaturgy and invisibility. And before I really start, I want to share with you a pithy maxim um, in honor of Adam and Joan and Arch uh, from the index card file of one of our teachers, Richard Gilman, who's quoting the Russian philosopher Nikolai Berdyaev. The bourgeois mind invariably prefers the visible to the invisible. So the litany of the assessing educator is, show me, because more is more. How do I know you went to the rehearsals? By your notes on each one. How do I know you were paying attention? By the copiousness of those notes. How can I be sure that you communicated with the director? By the volume of your emails. How do I assess your research, et cetera? By the volume of work product that you have churned out. By the massive pile I can tell my colleagues that I still need to read. And we puff up our own selves to ourselves, to our peers and our colleagues, to our tenure reviewers, by advertising our professional deliverables in the terms that we have borrowed from the bourgeoisie, in measurables, number of scripts, piles of images, pages, articles, graduates, productions, etc. In this and our s in this we and our CVs are like the condiments and the salad on the frank of my joke. The explanation of a joke, as Freud says, is never funny. But what's funny about my joke falls not so much on the double meaning of making me one as it does on the function of everything. For the Zen student, becoming one with everything involves an effacement of the self that allows him or her to disappear into the richness of the cosmic landscape. But for the consumer of the hot dog, everything is a lot. We can consume it, but we don't become it. It's a bellyache. It's the complete opposite of transcendence. Three years ago, I began to work with the director and choreographer uh, David Brick, who's my colleague in Headlong, uh, on what we th called then subliminal dances. These performances are made in public spaces for an unsuspecting public of passersby who never know, if all goes well, that they've witnessed a work of art. Our goal was to give folks a feeling of the specialness of the everyday, the sensation that, as David wrote to me, the day is entirely as usual, but somehow everything glows. These subliminal dances have evolved to become a part of a larger piece, which is now called The Quiet Circus. Details and photos at thequietcircus.com, which occurs weekly in a public space on the Delaware River in Philadelphia. The invisible section of the piece, um, referred to among collaborators as the luminous world, is an ongoing dramaturgical challenge as we seek to utilize the bodies and actions of our performers, the landscape, and the history of the public, public pier that we're working on, which was a point of entry for immigrants to the city of Philadelphia in the 19th century, and a site where Africans were delivered to America to become slaves um, in the earlier moments of our city's long life. Because the luminous world is meant to be experienced without the screen of official cultural offering, free of the smell of art. There's no plot or story. Images are unframed by prosceniums. And we assume that our audience may see only a fragment of the large network of performing bodies that occupy the space. This work is hard and ongoing. I don't think we've mastered yet the dramaturgy of the invisible. But I've learned something about the invisibility of dramaturgy that I want to think more about. More is not more. My deliverables fall into the category of less is more very often. Not the notebook of research, but the salient point delivered at the right moment, not to prove my own intelligence, but to feed the process of the work's becoming. Not even the information when Thank a question you. can be posed in its stead. Um, and I'm happy to talk more with anybody at any time. Thanks.
This past year, I was the dramaturg for a, for a production of Angels in America at the University of Arkansas. When we began our dramaturgy work last August, our production team knew we had some challenges ahead of us. Most of our audiences and a majority of the actors working on the play would be undergraduate students who were too young to remember the AIDS epidemic. Plus, most Arkansas high schools lack comprehensive sex education programming. So we knew that there would be a wide range of information, ideas, and misconceptions that <coughs> our students might have about HIV and AIDS. How could we begin a dialogue that would be specific to the community that we were working with? HIV medicine has come so far over the past 30 years. With proper health care, a person with HIV can live a normal, healthy life. Medications can lower a person's viral load to the point of being undetectable in the bloodstream. But it's important that we continue educating people about treatment and prevention. Arkansas still has a high rate of infection, and as a region, the South accounts for more than 50% of new AIDS diagnoses each year. According to the CDC, people in southern states are less likely to know they're HIV positive and less likely to be linked to the medical treatments that can improve health and reduce the risk of transmission. In Arkansas and many other places in the South, there's also still a stigma about HIV. Because of misinformation, cultural or religious biases, maybe shame or fear, HIV isn't something people talk about very much in Arkansas. But not talking about it only intensifies the stigma, and stigma is the fuel of discrimination. Our production team decided that we wanted to create a community conversation about HIV. We partner with local organizations like HIV Arkansas, a nonprofit support and advocacy group for people living with HIV and AIDS. I asked the president of HIV Arkansas to help me put into words why having conversations about HIV was so important. His answer was to reduce the stigma, reduce health disparities, reduce discrimination, and dispel fear. Starting a dialogue gave us the opportunity to explore a wide range of tactics. We wanted the information we provided our audiences to be interactive. The goal of dramaturgy is not to proselytize the answers, but to ask the community what it needs. To connect our audiences to resources, we enlisted groups like Key Flags, Campus Pride, and Safe Zone Allies to build lobby displays outside our theater. These displays provided information like where to get a free HIV test, how to reach out for support, and what it means to be an ally. The director of Millennium Approaches hosted a panel discussion featuring activists and medical professionals. The director of Perestroika organized a documentary film series. As the project went on, the dramaturgy became increase increasingly collaborative. By the end of the project, the actors became leaders in our dialogue with the community. The same students who, just months earlier, knew very little about AIDS were now empowered to actively share information and fight the stigma of HIV. Producing a play is not a solution to any problem. When it comes to discrimination, the amount of work still left for us to do is infinite. And like any great piece of theater, Angels in America leaves us with more questions than it does answers. But that makes it the perfect jumping off point for a conversation that will extend beyond the theater. Thank you. Because we don't give up, we're going to try again. Um, I'm an early career dramaturg, um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, disabled bodies in American theater. In its simplest form, theater is storytelling. Stories are what connect us. Theater is the most versatile form in which to achieve this. 
So it should be second nature for the stories it produces to be as varied and complex as the people it represents. However, there is still a considerable amount of group exclusion, most notably in regards to those with disabilities. If individuals with disabilities were fully able to take part in the world of theater without being subjected to negative portrayals and stigmas, the theater and the art of performance would be positively reimagined to showcase the experiences and talents of the disabled community. And by change. First, let's talk about disability theory. Disability theory incorporates two different models. The social model states that society follows disability through its ideologies by adhering to the needs of the able bodied and ignoring the needs of the disabled. The medical model claims that disability is an impairment or limitation that must be fixed or cured in some way so that normalcy can be achieved. This is where common misconceptions and stereotypes come from and where ableism begins. Theater has already utilized disability in the past, but many depictions reinforce the same stereotypes that we want to diminish or focus on disability being fixed for a person to be whole. Inclusivity has to start with stories. It should begin with disabled writers. Once their plays are written, produced, and performed, they will become a model for how all playwrights should approach disability in terms of verbs and learn how to go about it in a way that's beneficial. In regard to able bodied playwrights writing about disability, a considerable amount of research should be conducted by a playwright and a disabled direction. If this is impossible, having a person or persons with a disability that is being explored as a one on one mentor to the playwright would be necessary. Where would the disabled actors get cast to play disabled characters, nor are they cast to play characters? that aren't classified but able-bodied. They need to do both because they're more than capable. Doing so brings inclusion to the forefront, normalizes disability on stage, so audiences see past their disability and evaluate them as a person, and highlights the diverse range of experiences we all have. It's equally important for individuals with disabilities to take on all other roles within the theater. For if this is only on stage, as a starting point, stable casting there's just two shows that inquire into disability and all the having the stable technicians and while adapting in theater just a technique may be difficult and let's do that. It's an inclusion. Is this on? Yes. Okay. So, um, Madison, we're having really technical difficulties on our end, so we're having some difficulty hearing what you're saying. Is there any way that you could uh, email me the text? Okay. All right. So we're going to distribute the text of your presentation because we're just not we're just not making it work here. And I'm really mm -hmm. sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> and it's uh, it's about the internet. It's about the internet connection here. It's just not stable. Uh, That's I don't okay. know, but um, I promise we'll we'll distribute it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think 
I think we will try and see if the connection uh, between Magda in here is um, a little bit better. Um, and we'll make a decision about whether or not it's actually working. And then, and because Magda also has some really exciting stuff to uh, share with us. Uh, so no matter what, we will make sure that we all have access to it. So let's give it a go. The presentation people. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, no, it's different. Never mind. You're fine. Tweet away. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, I today I want to talk about the project that we have um, since we started last fall, um, and the link to it you have in the schedule, um, I believe. Um, it's called the Data Times, and the basic premise is that people across the world have their own local um, get there, um, and particularly focusing on the actual um, task force. Um, the, the premise is a little bit different from what typically has been done previously. Uh, the previous model was that the Western uh, scholars would travel to various uh, you know, locales and um, learn about the particular theater and come and report on those theater um, to their Western audiences. Um, the, um, most of the world was not really involved in that kind of collaborate, collaboration. Um, and typically the research or the articles that came out of it would be uh, closed up behind the paywall. Um, so you had to have uh, access to, uh, to research libraries to be able to access them. Um, the model which we're proposing, which you guys can, uh, for those of you who have computer or um, cell phone, you can open the website. Um, the model which we're proposing is trying to undermine this previous model. And the, both the creators and the audience is um, diverse. And the audience we are publishing. So it is not specifically done for the Western eyes. And it's um, not um, um, know, meant specifically uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, uh, for those scholars and dramaturgs and other people. Um, the, um, the, the way that I'm so I'm really 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 sorry, but um, we're all we're still experiencing some difficulty. C um, can you email the text, and we'll distribute it? Do we? Did it get frozen? Um, I don't have a text. So um, you guys keep talking and book, uh, um, you know, a follow, uh, follow you up on Facebook. In your program, um, this is a. In your program, you have the the website address, and you can go to the website and check it out. It is kind of badass cool. It's it's pretty great. I highly highly recommend it. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so I guess the you know, internet is not working uh, well for you, some of you will see as we speaking, but we have over 20 thematic sections, um, over 100 editors um, writing from over 60 countries. Um, the stories are posted daily, um, articles are posted daily, 
Um, so um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Since launching in you know, November, we published around um, 800 articles uh, from uh, 64 countries about their local data culture. Um, so you, you know, you can check it out. And in the next few months, we will be developing additional features. Um, this is a good resource for your uh, students um, to diversify your, your syllabus as well. Hello. I'm Joan Robbins, and I'm here to talk a little bit about the dramaturgy of international theater. Uh, first, I thought I should provide you with a little bit of context, which as an audience of dramaturgs, I know you can appreciate. I would like you to imagine yourselves for a moment in Northwest Ohio. You are surrounded by endless fields of corn and soybeans and by endless numbers of Trump yard signs, which Trump's supporters continue to steadfastly and loyally display. That's the context. A little bit about the origins of the International Play Festival that I work on, which might also be relevant to the themes of this year's festival. In the fall of 2001, when the United States was trying to recover from the events of 9-11, Ohio Northern University, a small liberal arts institution, launched plans for a festival of new international plays. What could we do, we wondered, to counter the tide of xenophobia that had gripped the country and open ourselves and our students to cultural perspectives other than our own? Now in its 12th year, Ohio Northern's International Play Festival has staged world premieres of plays from around the globe. International theater artists have come to Ohio and joined with undergraduates to produce theater from no less than 16 countries and no less than about seven different languages. I co-founded the festival with our then uh, chair and producer Nils Reese. And for the last seven years or so, I have provided the primary artistic leadership for the festival, in addition to uh, serving as production dramaturg, although I have employed students in that capacity recently uh, as well. The design of each festival is unique and tries to address the content of that particular festival, whether that be uh, textual, cultural, or um, personnel. This, is, this flexibility is, is exciting and wonderful, and it's also very challenging. To give you just briefly an idea of that kind of variety, I'll describe in a hurry uh, a few years. In the early years of the festival, we commissioned new plays, uh, one-act plays from around the world, and tended to produce them two or three at a time. Another year, we took a more concerted thematic approach and invited two writers from either side of the U.S.-Mexico border to write plays specifically about immigration creating a pre-production framework that brought the two writers together during the creative process. It's a very interesting year. Uh, another example would be a year in which we focused on Native American theater, bringing a Native director and Native professional actors to Ohio to work with our students and form a company. We commissioned two new plays uh, that year from the Native community. That was really exciting. Um, in recent years, we've focused more fully on the translation process, commissioning newish plays, uh, tra new translations of, of newish plays that have been produced successfully in their home and host country, uh, and focusing on the translation proce process, commissioning the translation, and bringing the translators to Ohio as part of the rehearsal process. So that's what we do. Uh, and now the challenges are, uh, I face and how we uh, do it. I'm interested in assessing how the festival goes in every way, uh, what has worked and what has not worked and why. I've learned a lot over the years uh, through lots of successes, but especially through many, many failures. Uh, and I'm really talking here about the dramaturgy of curating a festival and the plethora of choices that go into the creation of such a fe festival. Throughout this variety, the, the primary goals of the festival have remained constant, and they are twofold. First, to promote new work for the international stage, and second, to provide an in innovative intercultural theater experience 
for our students and our staff and our community. One challenge uh, that I face uh, is to strike the right balance between those two objectives, which often live quite happily together, but sometimes can, be, can live in tension with one another. And by that I mean feeling the very vi real need to create full productions of new works. There are lots of reading opportunities. There aren't as many opportunities for full productions. And yet, creating a full production can also sometimes compromise the time and energy one puts into process. And that is uh, a very classic tension that we as dramaturgs have a special sensitivity to. Lastly, a very separate challenge, uh, the challenge of creating cultural authenticity with Thank a you. predominantly Hello, I'm Angela Latham, and I too am coming to you from a university context education, uh, educational theater. I'm at Governor's State University, which is in the south suburbs of Chicago, and I teach mostly the theater history courses and any dramaturgy. We're still s building that area, but the dramaturgy courses. And uh, as any of you know from uh, teaching and programs where you have maybe more a lot of other interests among your students, uh, exposing them, getting them to understand dramaturgy is a challenge. And I'm going to be very focused in scope, uh, which if you knew me, would kn you would know is not very much like me, but I'm going to focus on an assignment that I have developed that perhaps those of you in educational theater who are trying to groom future dramaturgs and also just create a greater sense of understanding uh, will perhaps find useful. And when I, if I, run out of time, uh, this is an assignment that will appear in the next edition of Source Book, uh, so it will be there. And if anyone's interested in any copies of anything, I'm happy for you to email me as well at A-L-A-T-H-A-M at govst.edu. You can check with me for the address if you need it. Um, the questions I'm working with in the uh, assignment sort of to frame what I'm trying to do I'm asking questions of this sort. How do we expose more theater students to the practice and principles of dramaturgy? And how might that kind of exposure on a practical curricular basis increase the number of students who are interested in the work we do and also increase the understanding among all students uh, of theater to better co uh, learn to collaborate with and appreciate the work of dramaturgy? The assignment I give and I'll come back to those broad strokes ideas and uh, as I close out with uh, some sense of where I think the outcomes lay in this assignment. The basic assignment is, I call it dramaturg for a day, and I most commonly use it in my uh, history, the, the general history course that most theater majors have to take. Uh, the actually, uh, we have two, and you may have more, but in the history courses where we assign a lot of plays to read, I uh, have the students each sign up early in the semester for a play that they will become the dramaturg for. And they uh, take an active role then in presenting a dramaturgy structured lesson of 20 to 25 minutes to the rest of the class. Uh, I'm, I'm very structured with the assignment because in my context at least, most of the students who enter my classroom do not know what a dramaturg is, how to pronounce it, how to spell it, any of that. and. Um, so I, I give them a very clear uh, set of the kinds of questions to pursue. Uh, I give them a rubric that I will use to uh, evaluate the quality of their work, which is, of course, based on depth and uh, thoughtfulness, uh, the kind of discussion they're able to generate with the class. And they're to treat it essentially as though they're a dramaturg visiting a rehearsal. I do use this, by the way, in a much simplified, uh, uh, as a, a simplified option, even in my intros to theater appreciation class, which may seem a stretch, but um, if you are interested, that that would be another way to, again, expose more people to the notion. It's an option as one of the practical assignments that my students can take. Um, they I allow them to take an imaginative approach to a type of theater work and uh, create a portfolio. So this is one of the options in that group, too. Uh, anyway, the, the details of the assignment, as I say, will be forthcoming. I'm not going to go into everything. 
uh, here for sake of time, and I will just say that as far as I can tell, the outcomes include uh, exposure to critical, historical, and aesthetic considerations in a more applied way than is often possible through reading a play for class discussion. Uh, it's an en a more engaging approach, and it certainly uh, teaches students a little bit about how to create discussion in a context of, of peers. And it exposes all majors to methods for deep reading a play, regardless of what uh, track they plan to pursue. And my uh, hope is, of course, that those who may have come in thinking, assuming they were going to act or what have you, uh, those nerds among <laughs> the group, <laughs> secret nerds like me at least, uh, may find their way to dramaturgy as a, a, a better place for their, their particular skill set uh, in some cases. But also, they learn how to, I think it helps the costumers, the, you know, all of the folks in the classes who have worked with uh, Thank dramaturgs you. to know better how to do so. Hi, I'm Allison Ruth. Um, what is the relationship between structure and anger? Are dominant structures more primed to facilitate certain types of rage more than others? Um, there is now, and it's not new, a type of prohibition on forthright expressions of women's anger. And I'm curious about this reality's relationship with theater. Uh, being a dramaturg, someone thrilled by structure and its possibilities, I wonder if there are expressive limitations to Aristotelian structure, specifically in its ability to impact the way women communicate their anger. The endurance and prevalence of Aristotelian structure in white, European, and American theater certainly suggests that Aristotle was describing something intrinsic about the way drama works and the way humans experience story. What makes Aristotelian structure so ripe for feminist upending is its sanctioned dominance over Western drama. When structure, dramatic or societal, becomes identified as a source of oppression, then the subversion of its structure becomes an act of revolution. In the context of living under patriarchal structures um, and systems of oppression, the form of the story resides at the very heart of the art making. So over the past year, I've become fascinated with plays by women that explore anger in formally exciting ways. And my dramaturgy colleague, Lucas, who will speak next, um, we became really interested in Sarah Kane and what, how she's using violence and anger in her work. Um, and what we found was a fascinating dramaturgy that's unignorable in its chaotic structure. Um, we know that form was of great interest to Kane. Besides its commanding presence, in her work, in interviews about Blasted, which we'll talk about, uh, the first of her plays, she states as an explicit goal uh, that she wanted to create a form for which there was no obvious direct precedent, um, a, a form that had never been created before. Um, so one of the most striking ways that she subverts traditional structure is in crafting a plot that does not progress in steps that show a cause and effect progression. And this structure, I argue, is a way to amplify the absence of attention paid to Kate's anger in the story. Um, and I visualize the play like a pond, and you drop a rock in the pond, and you expect to see a ripple, uh, but the ripple shows up over here where the rock was not dropped. Um, and so we're left to wonder about the first rock's effect. Uh, what's the reaction to that event? Uh, the play if you might know it, uh, opens with a character abusing another character, and by the end of the play, that their relationship has, has switched. But the way that we get from A to B, from action to action, mocks a tri type of traditional dramatic arc. Um, in a faux sort of climactic moment, a bomb explodes outside the hotel room, mimicking the type of random, nonsensical, violent event that occurs in wartime, but also perhaps jabs at the false cleanness of this type of climactic event in Aristotelian form. And just as the physical structure of th on the stage is demolished and the characters must deal with it, so too does the structure of the storytelling disorient the audience. Um, so these curiosities about what's going on between anger and structure are messy. The terms I'm using are really too broad to have much meaning. There's, of course, no monolithic example of female anger. There's no one type of rage that 
a, a unified sisterhood experiences. Um, and I'm also interested in exploring this word anger, um, not purely in a domestic sense, but in a larger historical sense as a broad word to describe um, responses to oppression. Um, in particular, um, I became very interested in asking these questions this year as I felt everyone's anger build up and seep out, but especially from women um, uh, in response to mistreatments on a national level. Um, so I invite all of us to continue thinking about the relationship between anger and the structures that cause it. Thank you. I am a dramaturg and a violence designer. Many plays have violence, far fewer have fights. Violence encompasses all acts of physical aggression. Fighting, by contrast, is when two combatants engage in a violent altercation, most often with mutual agreement upon the course of action, the fighters being trained and fairly evenly matched in skill. Uh, Hotspur Hal, Edmund Edgar, Macbeth Macduff, etc. However, going back to Sarah Kane, the soldier sucking out Ian's eyes in Blasted could hardly be said to be a fight nor would it be fair to say that when Tinker cuts off Carl's tongue in Cleansed and then forces him to swallow a ring, that Carl and Tinker are fighting. The characters here are not trained in any combative discipline, and the violence is far more one-sided. The role of aggressor and victim do not change, whereas in a Shakespearean fight, we may see shifts in which duelist has the upper hand. Such a fluidity of perpetration is not present in Sarah Kane's violence. The presentation of stage violence exists on a spectrum that extends from the Bard's narrative clarity all the way to Kane's total rejection of cause and effect. In the works of William Shakespeare and Sarah Kane, we see two radically different approaches to the presentation of stage violence, both equally powerful and innovative. Shakespeare uses violence and fighting as an explicitly plot-based tool, often terrifying but always safely under the blanket of a forward-driving narrative comprehensible in its use and effect. Kane, on the other hand, pushes her violence outside the realm of the purely narrative to the point where the audience's personal safety is questioned. Kane's violence encompasses many aspects not found in Shakespeare. It is inexplicable, unfounded, and exists in a realm of perpetual instability. It could arise for no identifiable reason. It subjects the audience to a barrage of horrors in the interest of enlarging their sense of the world's suffering. It is sensory and visual, while Shakespeare's is functional and auditory. Shakespeare relishes in cause and effect, while Cain dismisses it outright. Shakespeare's orthodox methods serve to ideally highlight the thoughtful revolutions Cain employs in her dramaturgy, and her departure from traditional modes of violent representation is best juxtaposed with Shakespeare's observable, functional, combative depictions. While Shakespeare finds power in fighting's ability to change and alter people, Cain's violence often traffics in the sheer meaninglessness of the event. Limbs will be removed, tongues extracted, genitalia lopped off and barbecued, and we will still be left with the question, has anything changed at all? This is not to say Cain's violent strategies are careless or arbitrary. On the contrary, their placements and functions cunningly subvert narrative norms by not being placed in ordinarily consequential points in the story therefore not allowing the audience the traditional catharsis we might expect from such acts. Cain will take such events that seem consequential and not put them in structurally momentous places. Instead, she will take unexpected threads of narrative and bestow them with uncommon import. Cain's plays wreak havoc with what is or is not a major plot point. Blasted, the mo in, in Blasted, the most traditionally trackable through line is food beginning with Ian's gin guzzling and champagne devouring, moving through the room-serviced English breakfast, which then get devoured by the soldier who proceeds to suck out Ian's eyes. We witness a devolution of edibles as Ian's hunger eventually drives him to the climactic eating of the dead baby, a recognition of cannibalism that is immediately reversed by Kate bringing in liquor and sausage. Normally, in a play which deals with such enormous topics as Blasted does, who has food and when would not be the most foundational narrative recurrence. But if one were to find the Freitag's pyramid of the play, food would be the intrusion, the emotional midpoint, and the final crisis. Despite the presence of abominations, Cain's interest lies beyond the sensational. In fact, two of Blasted's major violent acts, Ian's rape of Kate and the suicide of the soldier, are not even seen by the audience. 
Cain seems to be shifting our focus away from areas towards which our attention would normally gravitate into the direction of places where we might not ordinarily look. She is asking us not to view horrors simply as things that are bad, but as events that demand more thought and scrutiny than we have previously realized. She is not asking us to take a bath in awful. If properly directed, we should come away from blasted, stunned by our ability to overcome our usual passivity to witnessing violent crimes in entertainment. Brecht-like, she is making the familiar strange, arousing our capacity for action, and making us privy to sufferings that appall us because they are unnecessary. Unlike Shakespeare, whose placement of stage combat serves to illuminate the moment at hand, crystallize characters' intentions, and move the plot forward, Kane's directions provide a deepening of the play's sensory landscape, a questioning of the motives that caused the violence, and an emotional brutality stunning in its power regardless of its political implications. Shakespeare's stage directions are practical, while Kane's Thank provide- you. Hi, I'm Jessica Rizzo, and uh, today I'm going to be talking about aspects of a play I'm directing in New York in the fall, uh, Alfredi Jelinek's Shadow, Eurydice Says. Uh, Jelinek won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2004 for, quote, her musical flow of voices and counter voices in novels and plays that, with extraordinary linguistic zeal, revealed the absurdity of society's cliches and their subjugating power. That's the Swedish Academy's uh, justification. Uh, so far, however, she's only received one major production in the U.S. Her play Jackie about uh, Jackie Kennedy had a run at the Women's Project in New York in 2013. Uh, I hope I'll be able to spark some interest in her work here at LMDA for those of you who haven't heard of her because uh, if there was ever a dramaturg's playwright, uh, it's Jelinek. She writes uh, texts for speaking or language planes rather than plays, performance texts that unfold in long, unbroken, uh, digressive and associative monologues that might go on for hundreds of pages. Uh, often foregoing characters and stage directions altogether, Jelinek's frequently confounding texts require uh, muscular intervention from directors and dramaturgs in order to render them stageable at all, uh, which might offer one op explanation for her conspicuous absence from stages in the English-speaking world, where stricter fidelity to the text is something we tend to value more than directors do in, say, Jelinek's native Austria or the other German-speaking countries. Uh, Shadow Eurydice Says continues Jelinek's ongoing project of interrogating and rewriting canonical Western myths from a feminist perspective. Uh, she combines the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, Adalbert von Camiso's novella Peter Schlemmel, The Shadowless Man, and Freud on Morning in Melancholia and The Death Drive to create a very contemporary feeling piece about gender and age. Uh, out of all of Jelinek's texts that have yet to receive their North American premieres, this one suggested itself to me as being of uh, particularly uh, being particularly relevant when I realized that Jelinek is almost exactly the same age as Hillary Clinton, uh, whose failed presidential bid last November suggested that we as a culture still have a difficult time knowing what to do with older women who, presum who presume to speak with authority. Uh, in Jelinek's version of this story, Eurydice rejects of her own volition the masculine world of the living in order to remain in the underworld, which becomes a fluidly feminine uh, negative space of non-identity and non-existence. The text reflects on the ways in which access to language continues to be treated differently for men and women, with language often functioning as an instrument of reason and power for men and as symptom of hysteria for women. Uh, Orpheus the singer is characterized as a dangerously charismatic rock star in the style of Elvis Presley, able to uh, whip throngs of pubescent girls up into erotic frenzies with the most modest warble. Uh, Eurydice is strongly identified with the presence of the author herself. Uh, she describes herself as a writer, but in extremely self-deprecating terms. Uh, I write, should anyone be interested, she says, and goes on to catalog her own alleged excesses as a stylist, the monotony of her texts, their repetitiveness, their incomprehensibility. She describes her writing process as something she has little control over. Her language leaks out of her, like so much discharge, she says, in one of uh, several parodically revolting feminine images that recur in the text. Uh, this account of writing as a fundamentally uh, passive process is not unrelated to Jelinek's theory of acting. Uh, she calls for performers in her plays to function as speaking machines rather than as actors embodying characters in any deep, nuanced, psychological way. Uh, viewing the luxuriousness of individual personality as a distraction, she's more interested in underscoring the oppressive limitations of the roles society makes available to us. And she does this by adopting what I think of as an industrialized approach to performance. In a Jelinek play, the character's language speaks them rather than the other way around. 
They are the results of an ideological system and a process of production that does not take individual differences into account except as new facets of uh, the market to be captured. Yelnyuk's critique of capitalism is that it is a system that on some level reduces us all to some version of this eviscerating passivity. Uh, where near infinite choice, opportunity, and creativity are touted as the system's virtues, in reality, this heroic capitalist individual is generally relegated to the role of consumer, whose identity is determined more by the brand she identifies with than with any desires that can be said to have authentically originated within her. So Yelnyak gives us speaking machines that have no within within. Uh, the components of their existence that resist quantification and monetization are simply excluded from Yelnyak's theatrical representations of the world, uh, creating a reductio ad absurdum. These figures are insistently shallow, all surface with no interior lives that we could productively imagine. When they, speak, when they cease to speak, they cease to exist. Uh, I actually think that this is a compelling strategy to use in performance because it is bound to fail. What I hope to achieve by taking Yelenyuk at her word here is to produce a theatrical situation that does do a kind of violence to performers by asking them to suppress what many of us would consider the most important, interesting, or distinctive qualities of an individual, her agency, her Thank subject. You. Hey everyone, Gavin Witt, he, him, her, his. Uh, Baltimore Center Stage, Jeannie Vallone could not be here. She's in Sofia, Bulgaria, but sends her best. She gets uh, equal credit, though, for what I'm about to share. At the New York City Conference a couple of years ago, some of you may have uh, heard me talk about or even had a chance to experience a project we've been doing for several years now, Right Right Now, uh, which uh, Kat Rodriguez helped uh, launch. This puts local playwrights, both emerging uh, and established, uh, in our lobbies, at special events, outside on the street, at food trucks, wherever we can imagine, and put them to take immediate custom patron commissions and uh, letting them into the sausage-making process, create a play for them on the spot, which gets sent out. Uh, it's been a huge popular success. It's created dozens, uh, sorry, featured dozens of playwrights and created hundreds of new plays over the last couple of years um, and helped make the process a bit more transparent uh, and, dare I say, accessible and inclusive. Uh, but it has its limits in all of those. Uh, it has no performance component, the most essential element of what I think makes a play a play. It gets written, it gets sent out, and it's a very singular exchange between the playwright and uh, maybe one, maybe two uh, commissioners. Uh, and it's limited to local playwrights. Uh, so this year, as you can see, we devised a new project. It's called Right Now, Play Later, uh, with an eye to th uh, increasing three aspects. Uh, to expand to nationally or internationally based playwrights, uh, to add the live performance element, and to expand participation and make it even more inclusive uh, using social media and various online platforms. Uh, and also, uh, in light of the, the uh, previous uh, presentation, to add the dramaturg for a day component in which you, by participating, got to go through the process of kind of curating your own new play festival from start to finish. One week each month for four months, from September through January, we identified three playwrights, or playwright teams in one case, uh, had a small rep company of five to six actors, and a theme, transportation, revolution, collection, restoration. If you scroll down, you'll see them. That's our website. It's got a nice little vanity URL, centerstage.org slash WNPL if you want to check out more. Um, we uh, themes, and then uh, create, uh, chose a civic site. Uh, we did a, a public carousel, the Amtrak station, a library, what have you. Uh, we would post a theme at the beginning of the week and call for prompts. We would take public prompts uh, over Twitter and Facebook. Uh, the playwrights then had overnight to take the prompts that they wanted and create uh, at minimum three short plays from those. The next morning, we distilled those into taglines, posted those taglines on social media. People would then vote on their favorite of the taglines, one favorite for each of the three playwrights or playwright teams. We then sent those to the actors. The next morning they gathered, they had 90 minutes to rehearse, and that culminated in a about a 30-minute pop-up, site-specific, script in hand, live-streamed reading performance of those works over uh, Facebook Live and Periscope. Um, I would say we got anywhere from 20 to 60 prompts each time. Uh, and probably had anywhere from 100 to upwards of 200 viewers. So we considered it a, a moderate success in terms of its access, inclusion, and participation. Uh, you can track back hashtag WNPL. 
which also I think is a ladies soccer league uh, and some other, some other things, but we're in there amongst that. Or check out the website. Uh, as I say, you can see the uh, drop downs here have uh, headshots and bios of the playwrights. They have all the plays that got created. Uh, there's also a wonderful little like two and a half minute sizzle reel you can watch. Uh, two Marcus Gardley plays, they're, they're excerpted. Um, we had great participation. Uh, so I'm sharing this now briefly for two main uh, reasons. One is we're really eager to open source this, eager to get as many brilliant ideas as possible. This uh, had many uh, four parents, uh, and it's based on anything from Watch Me Work to the Tiny Desk talk concerts to caricaturists at county fairs, uh, but I'm sure everyone has more good ideas and we'd love to make it better. Uh, it, the brainchild of many parents can always use more parents. Um, but we're also eager to franchise, to metastasize, to just grow in size. Um, and I'm really thrilled if people want to steal the idea, renew, recycle, expand. Uh, I can imagine this on college campuses and graduate theater programs with playwright actor teams. Uh, take it out to resident theater companies, whatever. So talk to us more We'd or just do it on your own. I'd love to see it grow and expand uh, and to talk more about it. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Robin Quick. Marvin Lusky, President Emerita of Towson University, asked the following of our graduates at each year's commencement. How will the world be better because you have been given a college education? How will you make your life one of service to others and the world's conditions? Students, what will be better because of you? Marvin implored us to continue asking these questions of future students. I believe her questions have become more urgent and challenging in the United States and the world. I've contemplated anew my responsibility to provide our students with the education that will help them respond to Marvin's call for a better world. I do not presume to have definitive answers to my hot topic. I bring questions, some possibilities to ponder, and the desire for further conversation. How are we preparing our students to attend to this deeply troubling moment in our nation and our world? Of the many productive paths to consider in pursuing this question, I will pick up one very specific that relates to the work many of us do. How might an education in the dramaturgical process, the activities of research, analysis, and collaboration, cultivate skills that translate to our task as citizens. For inspiration about the function of education and a vision of citizenship in the United States, I went back to the origins and studied principles articulated by our founding generation. Certainly their notions of who was included among the citizens to be educated was exclusionary in a way that we are still struggling to overcome. But I wondered if there were ideals of what that education would do revolutionary in their time that could speak to our needs in our time as applied to everyone. Our founders saw education as crucial to the shift of the populace from subjects to citizens. In a bill for the more general diffusion of knowledge, Thomas Jefferson warned that even under forms of government suited to protect the rights of individuals, those entrusted with tyranny, those entrusted with power, have in time and by slow operation perverted it into tyranny. His proposed solution was public education that would illuminate the minds of the people at large primarily through knowledge of the experience of other ages and countries. As a result, they might be enabled to know ambition under all its shapes and prompt to exert their natural powers to defeat its purposes. Throughout Jefferson's writing on education are insights about specific ways he hoped citizens would employ their knowledge and skills. Here are just three that I believe speak to the urgency of now. One, historian James Carpenter notes Jefferson's belief in the ability of people to make wise choices in electing representatives was based on the notion that citizens could be educated to discern facts and fiction. Two, Jefferson wanted all citizens to receive instruction that it would allow them to discuss issues and make judgments at the bar of public reason. Three, 
While he wanted citizens to be informed of their own rights, he thought they should equally respect the rights of others. He wrote that education would prepare each citizen to understand his duties to his neighbors and country and to discharge with confidence the functions confided to him by either. If we want to cultivate in our students the capacities to exert their natural powers, to defeat ambition in all its shapes, the transferable skills of the dramaturgical process seem ripe with possibilities. Here are three thoughts. One, conducting dramaturgical research informs and enriches our understanding of the world of the play and the playwright in ways that mirror Jeff Jefferson's vision of an education that illuminates the minds of the people at large and enhances our ability to discern fact from fiction. Two, Eleanor Fuchs says of the dramaturgical analysis, before making judgments, we must ask questions. What is this in process and form that of ci citizens who will make judgments at the bar of public reason? And three, the collaborative activities of dramaturgy provide an exercise in how each member of a community or nation might skillfully perform a function with and for others. Jefferson saw the education of citizens as a corrective to what might go wrong in this nation. Wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them right. Perhaps a dramaturgical education. Thank you. Okay. We designed this so that we would have 15 minutes left for conversation. Uh, I believe we have eight, <laughs> which is one reason that we did it the way we did it. Um, you also may have noticed that there were some uh, incomplete sentences. Uh, you can think of it that as our Brechtian technique um, to make you yearning for more and to make sure that you find the person who didn't complete the sentence and ask them to complete it. Um, the idea here is that um, we have lots of uh, different ideas uh, that can carry on. Uh, I didn't know this before we started, but I think what just happened is that we just dropped a whole lot of rocks and the response is gonna appear in a lot of unexpected places. Uh, I wonder if we could, uh, just as a community right now, um, give a name to some of those rocks, sort of like popcorn, except for we're going to call them rocks. Um, and if there are any responses to the rocks that come up, um, maybe we'll hear them. Now, we have a bigger audience than just uh, this room. And in the interest of time, I wanna do this in a way that is a little bit of an experiment because we have to use the microphone. Um, but if we try to pass the mic while we're playing this little game, um, that's, I don't think that will work. So impulsive idea that I have right now, and maybe we can try it, is for this room, we can hear without the microphone, but for that room, we can't. So if you guys drop the rocks in this room and I just repeat them in this room, we might be able to accommodate both. Are we ready to try? Great, yes. <laughs> okay, any rocks? Yes. Jessica, where is the production in New York? At the American Theater for Actors on 54th Street. Yes. Do you have an electronic copy of the script? She does. <laughs> These aren't rocks. <laughs> Incomplete sentences, right. Yes. New ways, new ways to look at structure from a female perspective. The the, and uh, 
agreed, yes. I think we've moved beyond the women are circular and men are direct. <laughs> that was my era. <laughs> Is that the only rock? Violence designer. Okay, intriguing way to approach a script. Yep. Yes. More things framed as steal this idea. Yes. How do you measure the invisible? Right, and also, I, I would add, how do you protect the invisible? Because I think that we as dramaturgs uh, are obsessed with giving voice to the invisible, and sometimes that's the most damaging thing we could do. Yeah. Pleasure and sadness, purpose, in unhappiness. Yes. Speaking to multiple generations at once. Yes. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna do something now that I sometimes do as a teacher. <laughs> it's, this is a secret, but not for long. <laughs> okay, so what Cindy just said, I stopped listening because I started to worry about how I was gonna encapsulate it in just a few words. Um, so I need someone <laughs> who didn't have the microphone in their hand and didn't start having that anxiety who can help me out and give me just a few words to help like encapsulate it so so I can say the thing I didn't hear say that again combat has rules rage doesn't excellent um, uh, before before we go on I lost my timer is Kathleen still here yeah, okay, so two minutes. Okay, when I have one minute, will you give me a hand? Okay, great. Yes. What is the dramaturg's role in facilitating the rage of marginalized communities? Yes. Is it... Th Yelenek's definition of a play, or is it of an actor as a speaking machine? I Texts for speaking, spoken by speaking machines. Okay, I'm about to get cut off. She is. Welcoming muscular intervention of dramaturgs and directors. Thank you. Thank you. 